Good morning, everyone. My name is Amaris Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations, and I want to welcome you all today to our first session of our Archives 101 webinar series. This series is made possible through an Archives Collaboratives grant from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission of the National Archives, and we're incredibly grateful to the NHPRC for their support of this project. Um, we have with us today, Kathy Crogwell Varda, who's the Director of Conservation Connection and whom many of you may know from her work around the state in various projects, including the Traveling Archivist Program, Museum Makeover, the New Collections Assessment Grant, as well as her own work as a museum consultant in Connecticut. Um, Emily Garfinkel um, is also, also with us today um, from CLHO. She's our Membership and Programs Manager. Um, and we will all be keeping an eye on the chat, um, but our, our presenter today, Martha Smalley, who Kathy will introduce in just a moment, um, has a presentation for us. Um, and if you have questions as you go, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll be sure to cue those up for Martha um, when she's finished her presentation. I wanted to say, I know that some of you may have questions about some of the logistics, accessing Google Classroom and things like that. I'd ask you to keep those questions until after um, the presentation and the Q&A related to the presentation. Kathy has agreed to stay after our presentation for a few minutes to address any of those questions and we can walk you through accessing Google Classroom and things like that at the end. Um, so uh, if you have any questions on that, I just ask you to save them for the end so we can really focus on the content for today. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Kathy to introduce Martha. Kathy. Thank you, Amaris. Good morning, everybody. It's fabulous to see so much interest um, in the Archives 101 webinar series. As a lot of you know, I've been working with the State Archives and the State Historical Records Advisory Board since 2009, bringing archive programs. So really excited and happy to be working with Amaris and Emily and everyone at the League in this bringing what we've done in the past, because I see some familiar faces, but bringing it to you in an online format. So thank you all so much for being here. I uh, want to get right into it. So let me introduce to you Martha Smalley. Um, Martha was the special collections librarian at the Yale Divinity School Library for many years and continues to do archival consulting there as well as elsewhere in her mm -hmm. retirement. She has led archival training workshops throughout the United States, Africa, and Asia, and she has been one of our traveling archivists through uh, since 2016, and got to say, she's one of my favorites to send out when I get one of those phone calls. Um, we need someone to really help kick us off. Martha is your, your person for those kind of projects, she's, and that's why we asked her to do this presentation today on the basics of archival acquisition and appraisal. So Martha, let me turn things over to you. Martha, you just need to unmute. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Everybody can see that, I hope. So um, thank you for inviting me to do this. I'm looking forward to not only the presentation, but also interacting with people afterwards. Um, it's been great to see lots of comments coming into the Google Classroom, and I'll try to respond to some of those either in the presentation or afterwards. So I'd like to begin by noting that although I have more than 45 years of experience in the archives field, I have worked primarily in a large academic library setting and a very well-resourced one at that. Uh, my work in the last five or so years as a Connecticut traveling archivist has exposed me to a variety of smaller local settings, and it's very op eye-opening to see. Um, I would say that many of the issues faced in all settings are the same, but I'd like to acknowledge that there are probably people in the audience today who have more experience in smaller local settings than I do. So I do welcome your feedback and suggestions when we get to the questions and discussion part of the session. I think one of the exciting things about archival work is that there is no kind of one size fits all solution in most cases. It's not cookie cutter kind of work. It really requires judgment calls and a, a sense of what your own setting is. 
but I hope that this presentation will provide a good foundation for you to sort of figure out what works best in your particular situation. Okay. All right, so these are the questions that we're uh, gonna consider today. Uh, what is it that we are seeking to collect? How do we go about collecting these things? If we're offered a donation, how do we decide what to accept? And do we need to keep all the materials that have accumulated over the years? How can established policies and procedures make our lives easier? So those are the things that I'm going to try to touch on today. Um, this is a diagram that I'm going to show a couple few times throughout the presentation. So I'd like to begin by talking about that. As you can see, it's a Venn diagram. And so the concept here is that there are these different factors and the ideal material for your collections would be in the center there where there's an overlap of these three different factors. Um, to identify whether something is relevant to your collection, you need to have a clear sense of what your collecting policies and parameters are. So that'll be one of the important things that we're talking about today is how, how do you determine if something is relevant? Uh, historical value, when we talk about that, I think we should consider who your particular users are in your setting, uh, what kind of information is useful to them, and keep in mind uh, too, that some material could be relevant to your collecting parameters, but not be valuable because it, say, lacks identification or it's so fragmentary. There may be reasons why it's, you know, somehow fits into the collecting policy, but really isn't going to be useful for people in the future. So that would be another factor. And then the factor that I've described here as fit uh, relates what, to whether the material is appropriate for your particular setting. So say you're offered 50 boxes of papers of some prominent town resident, and they're relevant, they're historically valuable, but do you have the space and the staff to treat the material responsibly? So that would be one example, and we'll talk about later others later, of something that might fit a couple of the factors, but not really fit into your particular setting. So this slide shows the beginning of a, a collection policy uh, that I found online, which I thought was a, an interesting kind of model just to, to base our discussion on. Um, it's from the Cambridge Historical Society in Cambridge, Mass. And it's quite elaborated and it might be more than you need in your own particular setting. So um, when I've worked with some other of the um, libraries as a uh, Connecticut, traveling archivist, we've worked on a sort of pared down and more um, simple version of this collection policy. And in the Google, Google Classroom classwork section, there is a copy of this, of a sort of generic uh, collection policy document, which I know that some of you have looked at already, and I hope that others will after the presentation. And just think of it as a sort of basis for discussion with your uh, director or your volunteers or your whoever's in, involved in your collection to talk about uh, how it fits into your setting. So um, the, the idea here is that we're, we're gonna go through and look at each of these uh, sections as much as we have time for. Um, so the first thing that's mentioned is having a mission statement. And I, I expect that most of you do have a mission statement of some type. Uh, these are just some clips of ones that I've found on the, on the internet for different local Connecticut um, historical societies. And um, they are more or less elaborate and there are probably other documents that you have that elaborate on what you show on the website. But that that's sort of the basic mission statement. <clears throat> I would say too that you know at this time um, it's a, a good it may be a good time to reflect on your mission statement in terms of the sort of more modern emphasis on inclusivity and 
to think about whether your mission could be expressed in a way that uh, really gets at the whether you want to uh, preserve and collect and share history of all communities that have been in your area over periods of time and so forth. So just as an example of that, I'll, I'll bring up this one uh, from the Westport Historical Society, which I think is interesting in that it, um, it at towards the end there, it says that they want to encourage a holistic view of local and national history, inclusive of all of the histories of all people and groups represented in their in American heritage and in their area. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're having discussions uh, with about your collection policy and starting with your mission statement. Are there ways in which it could be um, brought up to date and and in this way? So these are uh, the sort of basic questions that you have to consider uh, for your collection. What are the parameters of it? What's your particular niche? Uh, how is your institution or society defined in relationship to other local or state institutions, societies, and agencies? So you, in some sense, need to do a survey of your competition, but think of them as partners. Uh, this is just the section from the Cambridge Historical Society about this. It says the society recognizes that its collecting interests overlap those of many other regional institutions, particularly those with special collecting emphases. And it gives some examples of uh, different places in Massachusetts, in this case, that, that overlap with them in some way. Um, this same point is made in the Reference and Users Asso Services Association guidelines for establishing local history collections. It says establish and maintain a dialogue between local institutions, societies, and agencies. Consider what is currently being collected, what services are needed, to what depth such collections are being developed, and what collaborative or cooperative agreements are needed determine the most suitable repository for particular materials with respect to use, dissemination, and preservation. So this is taking a, the sort of uh, more bird's eye view of seeing your collection in, uh, con in context with other uh, collections in the state or in the, in the region or in your area. How do you fit into this uh, as you begin to define the parameters of your particular um, uh, repository. So this is just an example, I think, that relates to that. This uh, State of Connecticut Register and Manual is a uh, set of documents that I've seen actually in a number of different uh, repositories or local history associations that I've visited as a traveling archivist. And I understand why people might have this on their shelves because it does provide very valuable information. You can see in the clip here that it, it's telling the names of people living, their age, their birthplace, their occupation and so forth and so on. So this is very valuable um, local information. But the point I want to make here is that the Connecticut State Library has made these, nearly all of them available online. And in fact, they're much easier to use online than in the paper. So this would be the kind of thing which, as you think about the types of materials that you have in your um, organization, in your, your collecting area, is there material here that can be accessed elsewhere, either online or in a, a, another library, so that you don't need to consider this to be really part of the parameters of your own collection? I'm sure that in your settings, you may be able to think of other things that, that would fit into this sort of category. So if you want to, to get a clear written definition of what you seek to collect, you're going to say, oh, is it your specific town or region? Are you going to collect official town records in any sense? Area families, how about their children who moved away? and want to send you materials. Area businesses, schools, historic houses, places, genealogical material, secondary sources that relate to your area, artifacts, artwork, costumes. So 
these having a as clear or um, detailed uh, definition of what you're seeking to collect, collect as possible, I think, is important because, in some ways, this written definition is your ammunition both for collecting and rejecting material. If somebody offers you something, you can look, you can show them your collecting policy and say, well, um, this is not the kind of thing that we are uh, seeking to collect. Or if you're going out and looking for material, you can say, well, <clears throat> I'm kind of weak in this area. What do I need to supplement that section of our collection? So <clears throat> I think one way to, to begin, and the, the arrow here is pointing towards current collections, and that is that in the process of defining your collection, it's extremely useful to produce a document that kind of encapsulates or gives a succinct overview of what you have collected in the past. So you want to make a concise list of what types of material you have in your current collection. So when I started working at the Westport Historical Society, uh, they had, like in many other places where I visited, a fairly large room full of all kinds of very interesting things most of which had been individually accessioned as you know, a group or individual item. So they, they knew what they had, but really the only people who knew what they had were the long-term volunteers. It wasn't really easy to, to have a sense of the parameters of that collection uh, based on its physical uh, setting or on these accession records. So what I encouraged them to do was to think about the sort of broad categories of material that were in the collection. And this list here represents sort of what we found there, and it may resonate in your situation or it may not, depending on the type of uh, organization you are with. But in this case, some of the material was specifically related to the Westport Historical Society itself. So it was basically institutional archives. And, and that material could be broken down into um, the different uh, subcategories that you see here, sort of like official founding documents, board records, financial records, materials about their collections, programs, events, uh, publicity, reports, newsletters, and so forth and so on. So first of all, creating that larger category and then determining what are the sort of subcategories would help help them to have a sense of what materials uh, they have. And in, and in this case, actually, they found that in the storage room, there were quite a quite a gap in the minutes of their board of directors. And so that was incentive for them to go and look in some other offices and, and, and places within the building to find those minutes and, and gathered them together so that there was a complete uh, record. Now, in the case of the Westport Historical Society, they actually do have some Westport town records, although they're by no means the central repository for them. But these are largely historical materials. And um, so that was another category that seemed fairly distinct. Another one we defined in this case is just places because there were a variety of different types of material where there was not large amounts, but you know, significant amounts related to different historical sites or landmarks in the town, buildings, historical buildings, cemeteries, parks, and so forth, uh, and churches. Now there was a, a one case in here where they actually had quite a significant amount of material from one particular congregational church in town. And so that was a case in which they made a separate category for the Greens Farm Congregational Church. But this was a way to gather together and get a sense of materials that, generally speaking, related to different places in town. And the same thing was uh, for the fourth category, which was sort of events and activities related to different anniversaries in town and different topics like transportation, things that sort of fell in uh, the between the cracks. There are a lot of arts and culture going on in Westport, so they had material related to the different uh, 
theater venues, events, and so and so forth. So that was another category. Civic organizations like the League of Women Voters, the YMCA men's group, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that was another category. And then people, in their in their case, there they had. Um, some, you know, small collections, in some cases, just a folder worth of material related to uh, different individuals or families, but original documentation. In other cases, they had quite significant amounts of material related to like the Adams family or the Davies family or the Jennings family and so forth. So there, there we were thinking about, well, how can we, how can we um, present this material so that people know in a from your website or from looking at this document, what types of material to expect uh, to find. Uh, and then the fourth category here is interesting one, and I think it might resonate with some of you based on some of the comments that I saw in Google Classroom. And that is what, what we called named research collections. These were materials that were gathered by other people like historians or people who are writing a book or who had a particular interest in local history. So it's there basically their research collection of things that they had gathered on different topics. And in most cases, it was not original material but rather things like newspaper clippings or copies and, and so forth and so on. And the I could see that these would be very useful because if, if the historical society were, um, for example, creating an exhibit about an area, they might want to look and see what this person in the past had had found out about that topic. And so we wanted to keep that material, but but to respect what's called the provenance of the material. That's who generated it, where it came from. It it seems wise to keep it together as under the name of the person who gave that material rather than necessarily integrated into some of the other categories. So that that's a, a particular situation, but it, you may find uh, the, that that happens in your organization too. Uh, another category was photographs, and then I ran out of space on the slide, but you get the idea here that they were, these are the different kind of uh, broad categories that help give a sense of the parameters of the collection. So there's, it's not rocket science by any means to, to, to make a collecting policy. It's actually you know, just sort of a lot of hard work in some ways to sit down and hammer this out. Uh, you, you basically want to be writing an acquisitions policy for collecting the materials, stating what the intended geographic area is, um, describing the kinds of materials that you want to find, what kinds of formats are you interested in, can you deal with um, audio-visual material, uh, electronic files, uh, uh, identify what types of material you will not be collecting because other places are better equipped to handle them, um, and also some materials may not be ex accepted due to preservation issues. If you are a fairly small operation and um, the material needs a lot of conservation work or is falling apart, and it's not doing it any um, favors to accept the material, it should be taken on by a place that's able, better able to, um, to deal with it. So in the, um, the Cambridge um, collecting policy and in a sort of generic one. This is kind of the more blow by blow uh, explanation of what it is that they're going to collect. So um, the first is that they collect only historical artifacts, works of art and manuscripts. Okay, so that's saying something, not every place is equipped to take works of art and artifacts, but they've, they are. And um, it's to interpret the history of their area and local families. Um, it doesn't accept artifacts that duplicate existing holdings unless they are a sounder physical condition or, or a better historical example. And uh, you can read those other ones yourself. It just basically it's it's giving a written definition of what it is that the 
the society is attempting to collect. And um, if this becomes part of a written collection uh, policy document. I think a sort of basic thing to keep in mind as you're doing this is the question of whether you have sufficient resources to, to collect everything that you might want to collect. Sometimes it's, you know, you, if you sit down and do kind of a brainstorming session, you might think, wow, I mean, these are all the things that would be relevant to our um, area here, the things related to military battles and um, architecture and, and, and the paintings and prints and drawings, furniture, decorative arts, costumes, you know, these are all good things. But um, it's important for you to, to keep in mind what fits into your particular setting as opposed to um, another context. So if we go back to our diagram here, uh, you can see that the collecting policy is trying to uh, reflect on these different aspects but the, the most important one in a way is the fit because you are saying specifically in your situation, what um, can we deal with? And uh, what do we have the space to uh, take and the staff to deal with and the preservation um, abilities to, to care for? As part of this, um, depending on the size of your organization, it may be useful to have a collections committee. So a collection committee would be a, a group of people who can provide counsel and assistance, but also serve as important buffering agents, so to speak. So I've heard many cases in dealing with local historical societies where they say, well, somebody just stopped by the office and gave us this box. And that I think is more typical than um, <laughs> you might wish. That's that there's people are using it as kind of a dumping ground for materials that they found in their attic or that they um, found when they were cleaning out a relative's house and so forth. And so if you have kind of a process in place to deal with materials, it's a way to say, well, you know, we will consider this material. Um, and maybe having a collections committee as part of that process for you. Um, so in the um, document, you might wanna, if you do choose to have a collections committee, you might wanna say specifically what it's going to do. Uh, and, and these responsibilities would include um, review of the policies, um, and then upon consideration of recommendations by the curator and executive committee approval, or rejection of gifts, purchases, acquisitions, deaccessions, and loans. Okay, so it becomes a, 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 a barrier that materials need to get past. They have to be approved by the collections committee. And uh, you may have such a thing, but it's really just your board or it's just a, you know informal, but uh, consider possibly putting it in to the collection policy as a as an entity uh, that because it is, as I said, a kind of buffering agent that can help you uh, say to somebody that this is not something that we can accept. It's not been accepted by the collections committee. Um, donor relations are obviously very important for local historical societies. And um, there may be occasions when you feel you need to accept materials that you normally would not accept. I mean, I think that's just logical in, in, in truth. and and. Is that why? It's because of who's making the offer, what other material he or she may potentially have to donate in the future, other factors. Um, having a very clear collection policy and a collections committee may be helpful in situations like this, but it's not a cookie cutter kind of thing. You need to, to use your judgment, I think, and there, there are always exceptions to rules depending on the situation. So I'd like to talk briefly about ways to acquire new content. Now, this may not be an issue for many of you. You may have more than enough to deal with without bringing more material in proactively. But if it is applicable, I'd just like to point out some ways in which uh, you can acquire new content. One would be 
uh, to reach out to local organizations, maybe civic organizations or us, other institutions that, that are creating records, but have no plans for preserving them. So if you think about what uh, types of organizations are active in your town or your area and contact them and say to them, well, what, what's happening to your older records? That one way would, that would be one way to suggest to them that it would be appropriate for them to, to, to give them to you for historic preservation. In the Cambridge Historical Society um, collection policy that I noted, they say collecting from groups and individuals and local businesses and institutions for whom collecting is not a focus, but, but who have amassed artifacts representing their own history and development. So that's something to think about. Are there groups and individuals like that in your area who could be approached? Um, you wanna think about whether all sections of your community are, are being represented in your collections. Um, in the Cambridge Society one, it says for the, for the society to become a true repository of Cambridge's history representative of the entire city, the current collections must be significantly broadened in size and in scope in order to more accurately represent the diverse communities that have historically contributed and continue to contribute to its development. Just some food for thought as you uh, consider. Other ways to acquire new content, one would be to get an article published on a local newspaper or in a town website about the fact what, you know, once you define what it is that you're collecting, if you, if you let people know this, they might, it might resonate with them and they say, oh, I have some material like that. There may be a local genealogy kind of club. Uh, other ways to gather material is to sponsor an oral history or memoir writing project have a booth or a display at some kind of town, a town event. I'm sure that other things might occur to you in your particular setting. So I think the bottom line here is to don't collect more material than you can process and store in a responsible way. It's a balancing act. You don't want to uh, take more than you can deal with responsibly, but you want to document the area as as comprehensively as you can. Okay, I'd like to talk now briefly about record keeping. Um, the deed of gift is a formal and legal agreement between the donor and the repository that transfers ownership and legal rights to the donated materials. A legal agreement is in the best interest of both donor and repository. That's from the Society of American Archivists and they have uh, brochures about deeds of gifts that you can get. Um, the, in the Cambridge Historical Society one, the, the way it's phrased is that material accepted into the collections must have a free and clear title. Donors may be asked to produce proof of title or sign a release absolving the society of liability resulting from an, any irregularities of title. The society does not accept uh, willingly or knowingly material that's been illegally obtained or imported or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the, the, the concept here is that uh, you want to be sure that the material that somebody is giving them is theirs to give you. And so a typical deed of gift, which is this agreement between your society and the donor gives their name and um, title description of the material that's being donated. It indicates how the donor came into the possession of the material. Did they inherit it? Did they purchase it? Did they just find it? How did they get this material? And the, don the deed of gift is a transfer of physical ownership of the material. And that is, you know, there are some places which take deposits of material, but it's in if possible, it's it's good to make it be a gift, a donation, so that you know it will always stay with you if you take the time to organize or rehouse it or whatever, that it will remain with you. Uh, the deed of gift also talks about uh, who can use the material and uh, the transfer of intellectual property rights is important in some cases, if it's a diary or letters and so forth by a particular person 
who can use these materials in a publication in the future? Who, who would need to be contacted if, they, if, if permission were required? So the donor may choose to transfer intellectual property rights to your organization, in which case in the future, if somebody wanted to use and publish this material, you could give them permission to do that. If they choose not to transfer the, the uh, copyright, then it's important for them to um, uh, be have have uh, information so that somebody can contact them to get that permission. And then finally, the the question of separations, which is an important one. This should be in the deed of gift. Um, that here it's phrased as in the course of arranging and describing the materials you donate, the repository staff will retain substantive materials of enduring historic value and separate out those materials that are duplicative or outside the collecting scope of the repository. So options that could be for getting separated, getting rid of the separated material would be to shred it, to, to give them to another repository, or to return them to the donor. And these options can be spelled out in the deed of gift. So uh, this is just a, a screenshot of the, the one that's in the Google Classroom classwork section as a very simple uh, deed of gift. These, uh, as someone said in the comments, uh, can be very lawyered up. And in fact, the, the deed of gift for Yale University doesn't look like this. It has like twice as much legal language in it. But these are the basics of what you need to establish, the information about the donor, the type of material, uh, what's going to happen to the material that's not retained by the archives, will it be discarded, returned to the donor or other. And then it, by signing this agreement, the person is saying that they're the sole owner of the materials and they have the full right and authority to donate them. And they are conveying to the archives the right and title and interest that they own. Um, this goes on to say, you know, how basically how they got this material, whether they inherited it or purchased it or someone gave it to them. And then um, the copyright interests, and they, they may or may not control copyright, but if they do, they have to agree that um, they want to either retain that copyright or transfer it to the um, society. Another kind of record keeping is the accession record. And that is basically to re register incoming material with either a paper-based records or some kind of computer spreadsheet or database. This is, whereas the deed of gift is between you and the donor, this is for your local information. So you know exactly what you've received and can tr track down when it came to you and who gave it to you and so forth. So this is internal information. And this is the kind, these, uh, are the different types of information that you would be seeking to um, acquire, to uh, put in each accession record for a group of material or an individual item. Uh, so when material is uh, received by the archives, these are the basic things you'd wanna do. You want, if the material is loose, put it in boxes, label, number the boxes, record the name and contact information for the person or the office that gave you the materials and the date of when they arrived, and also indicate how this material fits into your collection. Does it fit into one of those categories that you established? And how much material is it? Where are they currently being stored? Those are the basics of the accession process. Now I'd like to talk briefly about um, appraisal, and that is the, the uh, can, when you're offered material or you've accepted it and you're deciding what you're going to separate out, you're going to think about how it fits into your collection policy. And um, here again, these factors come into play of relevance, historical value, and fit. Uh, just we'll go through these very quickly, but just some examples. So say somebody gives you a whole set of interesting maps. Well, they might they might be relevant to your area. Uh, they might just have historical value, but that's the, the questions that need to be asked. What do they relate to? 
if they relate, if you're in New Preston, Connecticut, and there's some older map that relates to the area, yes, I can see that that would be interesting. If it's a map of China, maybe it's not. And so it's not something you should be accepting. Unidentified photographs. Somebody might say, oh, I have all this box and there, there are all these people, uh, you know, from town. But if, if we don't know uh, who those people are or the dates or the locations or something, this would be the type of material that would be uh, of questionable historical value because it maybe you want to keep it on the chance that somebody in the future will be able to identify them. If you have the space to do that, great. But this would be definitely borderline, I think, of whether it's appropriate to accept a, a large collection of unidentified photographs. Newspaper clippings is another thing that often comes in and here it depends on how other how rel how relevant it is to your uh, collection and whether the material is available easily elsewhere. A lot of historical newspapers have been digitized now, and then there are various preservation issues related to keeping news clippings. So this would be again a somewhat uh, area that's something that might be separated. Uh, this is a, a document, it's from a minister, but we don't know who the minister is or what town he was preaching in or what the date is. So does, is this a, does this have historical value? Yes, in some realm it does, but is it a good fit for your collection? Perhaps not. So these are just some examples of this type of thing. Um, Another question, do you need to keep all the materials that you've accumulated over the years? Uh, the answer to that is no. <laughs> it's, it's possible to deaccession materials and deaccessioning is when uh, an archives or a museum or library permanently removes accession material um, from its holdings. And that deaccessioning is a process of, of you know, saying, okay, we no longer want to keep this. Uh, an, another process is weeding so that you have a collection in hand and you may say, well, there's a lot of a lot of duplicates here. And you could say, I don't need to keep all of those duplicates and certain other types of material uh, that you see listed here may be uh, candidates for weeding to help sort of con condense and uh, strengthen your collections. So these are the kinds of materials that might be uh, candidates for deaccessioning they don't you don't know what they are uh, they don't fit into the current collecting policy they can't be identified you don't know where they came from they've never been used or they're not unique or archival uh, and some more which I won't go through right now because uh, we are getting towards the end of our time but those are things to keep in mind and then what do you do with this material that's being separated out or just deaccessioned? One good option is to transfer the material to someplace where it might be a more appropriate repository of, if that exists. Another would be to return the material to the donors or the whoever gave it to you. Uh, in some cases, materials could can be uh, sold, you know, depending on your situation and other uh, legal aspects of that. So um, all of this will be easier, this whole sense of deaccessioning, if it's part of your collection policy and if there are specific criteria noted in the collection policy about what types of material you will consider separating out or deaccessioning. And um, that it's once it's in written form, it becomes uh, more defensible, I would say. So, um, we are getting to the point where we want to be taking questions, but since this uh, session is going to be recorded, I'll, I'd like to go through this next document just to show the slides online if people wanted to go back at it, to it at some point. And this is a somewhat older document uh, in the, and the URL for it is in the, the notes that are in the classroom section of Google Classroom, classwork section. Um, but it's just, I think even though it's older, it does uh, give a good overview of this uh, process of creating a collection development policy. 
And it goes through kind of uh, blow by blow of what it is that you need to do in order to um, do the, do the um, make the document and um, gives you step by step a sense of the process of doing it. So as I said, it, it's not, um, it's not rocket science, it's hard work in many cases just to sit down and get agreement, consensus among a group about what should be written and um, how it should be phrased. And to, to um, then in step six, you here you see get the policy approved by the board of directors. I think that's is important that often there's some kind of governing board uh, for the society and this is, should be, uh, introduced to them and not just be a sort of in-house document, but something that's approved. Um, you can't keep it all. So a written collection policy is important for helping you uh, deal with donors, potential donors to let them know whether or not the material um, that they want to give you is a relevant, historic, has historical value and is a good fit for your collection. And then um, this is just an, in within this document that you have, this is just another sort of generic um, collecting policy, collection policy that you could compare to the one that's in uh, the classwork section and to what you already have existing in your repository. Um, there's some information here about appraisal. Um, it says how appraisal works. Unfortunately, there's not an easy answer to this question. So it's a judgment call about whether material is, is important in some cases, but if you have some parameters, it helps to make those judgment calls. And then the record keeping, the transfer of ownership, those are important um, to have those documents like the deed of gift and so forth that give you um, legal right to the material that's in your uh, collection. And then finally, deaccessioning material. If you, if you are in a situation where things have accumulated in your collection on a sort of topsy-turvy way over many years, and there's a lot of material that is in some sense not relevant to your current mission, this is your opportunity to consider how to, to uh, slim down the collection in order to make it more uh, useful. So these are the things that we talked about. And I hope that um, in this brief presentation that I've given you uh, some basis on which to get together uh, with other people from your organization and talk about these issues and actually get something written down that can be uh, distributed, approved by the board and um, be useful. So I am going to stop there and uh, you see my email there that I'm willing to take questions there afterwards too, as well as in the Google Classroom uh, setting if that's more convenient. So um, I'll, I guess I'll hand it over to you now, Amos. Great, thank you, Martha. I'm gonna um, just stop your sharing if that's okay. Um, sure. We can um, add your contact information to, um, to the Google Classroom if it's not already there so people know how to reach, uh, reach out to you. Um, so there's a question that came in that was, that's already kind of been addressed in the chat, but I think it's important enough that I wanna um, have you answer it or address it live as well. And thanks, Kathy, for um, getting to that as well. So Wendy asks, is it possible to have a collections policy if you haven't cataloged everything in your collection or is having that list an integral part of the policy? Um, and when she says policy, she's meaning a policy that's been adopted by the board of directors. Um, Kathy's short answer is no, you don't have to have everything fully processed. You can have a collections policy um, at the start or any time after that, but I wondered if you wanted to say a bit more about, you know, this kind of question about, you know, knowing what you have, how important is knowing what you already have to formulating a collections policy, mm -hmm. which I think is the heart of her question. Yeah. Well, I would say that, I mean, there are different levels of cataloging or description, and that's important to keep in mind. I personally think that having that first level of knowing the broad categories of what it is that you have in your collection is fairly important 
as you're defining a collection policy. Now, keep in mind that, that each of those categories should have a guide, should have a, a finding aid, which is the more detailed and cataloged. But that's the that's down the road, basically, where when you have time and, and people available to deal with that. So you can you can create that initial list of categories or what I called record groups in in my handout there as as I, I think that's fairly important to your collection policy because it, it gives you the sort of bird's eye view of what it is that you have uh, collected in the past and gives you a sense of you know, the types of things that you might want to uh, accept in the future. But keep in mind that that's not the end point. Each one of those needs more work. It needs the subcategories that were in some cases um, explained there and it needs beyond that uh, even more detailed uh, finding aid or guide. And there'll be sessions later on in this uh, webinar series, I think, about how to organize material and how to create the finding aids that actually make it more useful. Thanks, Martha. You know, if I may add one thing, Wendy, I wouldn't let feeling like you don't have everything fully processed get in the way of you creating a collections policy or a direction in which you and your organization want to develop the collections. Um, because I think that those things can be done together, um, that you wouldn't want to not create a collections policy until you had kind of like made finding aids for everything. You would, you know, even big repositories haven't done that. Um, you know, I've, in my time as a, as a historical researcher, I've worked at many university archives where I've been going through collections that haven't been processed. They kind of know what's in there, but there's no finding aid. Um, so I think that, you know, you wouldn't want to not move in the right direction of formulating a collections policy um, just because you didn't feel like you knew everything about your collections. Um, I guess if I can just say that. I don't know if the archivists have any problem with that statement, but... Um, yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> Great. Um, do so something more, is the. <laughs> yeah, do something right to move forward. Um, so there's some more questions coming in, Martha, if I can lob these to you. So um, Reza asks, what are some techniques to overcome resistance from senior staff or management or the board to creating policies like this over fears that the institution may miss out on something very valuable if we do not entertain all offers of donation, even without the resources to process those materials? Well, that's a political question, I think. Uh, um, I think that, as I, as I said, having the collection policy document is ammunition in, in a way, in that uh, if, you, if it's possible to have such a document that can, is approved, then, then it gives uh, the people who are actually dealing with the material some, some basis on which to, to make decisions and perhaps rejections. But, you know, as I said in my presentation too, I think that there are always exceptions to rules. And uh, it's only only realistic to believe that, especially in local uh, his history societies, uh, there are people who are important for various reasons. Uh, and I, 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 so I, I, I think that Ideally, the, the collection policy is um, created and approved, but perhaps with some kind of caveat in it, something, you know, some, some phrase in there that gives a, an out for um, accepting materials that, that aren't directly into the collecting scope. I think it, you know, it's, it's only a political reality to, to understand that that may happen from time to time. And you just want to limit it as much as possible to make it the highest percentage possible of material that comes in as being relevant to your collection. So. Can I jump in and add something to that, Martha? Because sure. I've heard this too <clears throat> from so many people. And the one thing I would add is, I think we sometimes forget our role in educating donors about what we are collecting and why. And that if you have this policy, you know, I sometimes say, all right, you're a good cop, the policy is bad cop. Someone brings in something you don't want, doesn't fit your mission, doesn't fit the scope of the collection. You say, well, I can't accept it because we have this policy that 
lays out what our parameters are. But let's talk about what you have that would fit. You know, you have a role in educating your donors. What they bring you isn't necessarily the best thing that they have or that would fit you. So be that understanding person when they come in or when they contact you and have a conversation, talk to them about this. And I think that sometimes does help board members understand that it's not just about taking whatever comes in the door, it's about having conversations with donors first and foremost. And, and Riza, if I can add one thing, I mean, there may be things that, you know, other folks at the institution who have some resistance to creating a collections policy, things that they might be worried about that could be addressed. Space. Staffing, right? If you don't have the space or the staffing to care for these things, there is no point in you having them because you can't make them available to the public. So it's not fulfilling your mission if you just have a bunch of stuffed closets full of stuff that you don't know what it is and you can't share it with people. Um, and I think that that, you know, I mean, to me, that's the argument for having a collections policy, you know, from, from the kind of, you know, perhaps board member or, you know, oversight perspective is keeping collections is expensive. And you don't want to take everything that comes through the door. And a collections policy allows you to decide, to define what you want to keep so you don't miss out on those valuable offers when they come by, but you can say, no, thank you. Here's what you should do with this. Or, you know, here's another option for you when something that you don't really want to steward and can't afford to steward comes to your door. So that's one thing that I might add to that from my own perspective. Good point. Yeah. Um, Adrian has a question um, about weeding, Martha. Um, if you could clarify the process, does this apply mm -hmm. to just to, for instance, institutional records as opposed to historical archives, meaning process manuscript collections? I would think an institution, uh, I would not think an institution should remove material from a manuscript collection or, um, or am I wrong? Well, I think it, it does tend to um, apply most to institutional organizational archives where you are more likely to have sort of routine administrative or financial records that don't necessarily need to be kept, or they may have collected material from some other organization and just had it in their office and, and then they pass that along and it really doesn't relate to them. But I, I think that I would say that if a collection, if a manuscript collection is already processed and described, then then perhaps not. But I've definitely seen uh, manuscript collections where um, a person might have um, multiple copies of something that they wrote, or they might have um, many many photographs of. Um, very, very similar views of something, you know, so there, I think there is room for some weeding in manuscript collection settings, but it's, it is, I would say more typical um, in, uh, for organizational records, but you might think about, you know, the fact that, that your own organization's records should be kept, should be archived and, and think about um, what types of material are being uh, generated by your own organization and how they are being kept because they're part they're part of your collection too and there might be candidates there for for making it a more um, clean and slim collection that material Does that answer the question I hope so <laughs> it sounded good to me Martha um, Adrian says thank you so um, so that is a good place to begin. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, there are just a couple of comments that that have come in in the chat that I want to share. Um, one from Sarah is that, you know, this kind of emphasizes to her that there's a big reason why this is a good reason why it's great to foster relationships with other institutions kind of in your area or in your collecting bailiwick to be able to suggest other repositories for donors when you don't want to take them right. You know, well, we this is not something within our scope, but these folks down the road or these other folks in this other location, they might be really interested in this. Maybe you should get in touch with them. I can connect you. Um, and Jesse says that it seems to me that a clearly defined collections policy also helps the organization shape its priorities and aligns its collections with its mission and identity. 
So um, we have one last question from Ingrid, um, and then I think I'm going to uh, let us close things out here and, and thank Martha for her time. Um, uh, so Ingrid asks, how can you assess the cost effectiveness of your archive overall? The cost effectiveness. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that partly has to do with your mission. Um, if you're, if a large part of your mission is to help educate people about the history of their area or about a particular topic or whatever, then to analyze or assess whether you are doing it well would be how much interaction you have with users and uh, feedback that you get for its use. Uh, cost effectiveness. Um, I, I, I don't know, Ms. <laughs> uh, would uh, Amherst or Kathy, would you like to respond to that? I mean, it's. it's... Yeah. That is a really, I have to admit, that's a really tough question. And I think um, cost effectiveness is not something I've thought of really from that point of view. But can you put a value, a monetary value on these items? Um, that's something that that gets discussed often you know what we have in our archives in all of these historical societies and museums that are participating today would they garner thousands of dollars at an uh, auction at sotheby's or christie's probably not but they're invaluable to your community and how it records and shares your history so for cost effectiveness <laughs> I think it's more important, as Martha was saying, are we making every effort to share this information so that people are accessing it? And um, I don't think you can look at it from like a budgetary or financial standpoint that way, but if it's accessible and available and the community is aware of it, I think you're, you're developing value that way. Thanks, Agreed. Kathy. I think that's a nice way to think about it. Um, we're at five minutes past 11. So I want to take this moment to, um, to thank Martha so much for this excellent presentation. Um, and uh, I was trying to uh, bring up our next session on um, next Tuesday will be with Linda Hawking and Leith Johnson. Um, on the fundamentals of archival arrangement and description. So once we have, um, you know, we've we've talked about like thinking about what you're taking in. Next week we'll be thinking about okay, once you've got it, how do you organize it? How do you describe it um, so that you know what is in this collection that you have taken in, or this collection that's been sitting in your back closet for a really long time and you don't really know what's in it. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all then, um, and uh, we'll stay on for a few minutes after the recording's passed um, to talk a little bit more about any issues you might be having with Google Classroom. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Emily. Thank you all for being here today, and we look forward to seeing you next week.